Hey, welcome back to the Lou Perez podcast. I'm your host, Lou Perez. This week, I'm very happy to introduce a new sponsor to the program. It's the Soho Forum. It's a debate series moderated by my friend and former guest on the Lou Perez podcast, Gene Epstein. The next debate is happening August 15th at the Sheen Center at 18 Bleecker Street in New York City. The resolution, climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Andrew Dessler will take the affirmative, Stephen Coonan the negative on the resolution. Both Andrew and Stephen separately appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast on the topic of climate change. Doors open at 6 p.m., the meeting convenes at 6.30, and afterwards, there's a reception. No mask or vaccination requirements. Head to the SohoForum.org for tickets and info. And I'm happy to report that right now, you can order my book. That's right, I wrote a book. It's called That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore, on the death and rebirth of comedy. Follow the link in the description or head over to Amazon and search for Lou Perez, That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore. If you want other options on how you can buy my book, please sign up for my newsletter at theluperez.com. You could also join my community at theluperez.locals.com. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you could leave a five-star review, that would be amazing. Whether you're a long-time listener or a first-time, five-star reviews are lovely. If you're looking for other ways you can support me, you can do so by supporting my sponsors. If you're into CBD products, please check out PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Use promo code LOU to get 25% off purchases over $75. And if you like cold brew, check out Black Organic Cold Brew at www.blvckbrew.com and use promo code LOU for free shipping. All right, let's go. very happy to be joined by my next guest. Her name is Louise Perry, and uh, she is the author of uh, the latest book. It's coming out in September in the United States. It's called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century. And the cover, I don't know if it's going to be the same cover, but the uh, the uh, British cover, the English cover, uh, it, there's a, a, a box of Kleenex on it uh so yes a box of unbranded tissues excuse me uh, excuse me that's right it's not a kleenex sponsored endeavor (laughs) (laughs) although maybe you know maybe the the next round i'm I'm available yeah there you go (laughs) louise the first question i want to ask you is uh do you ever go by lou do anybody call you that a few people do yeah my my family nickname actually has always been lulu i've been lulu since i was a baby um a handful of people do call me lou though I used to, I had a hockey coach. I played ice hockey as a kid and uh, he was the only one who called me Lulu. Um, and he was kind of oh, a tough guy. Oh, he was, he was a, for, a, for, a man, for a man's nickname. Yeah, he was, a, he was kind of a tough guy. I didn't have the, you know, the, the gall to tell him like, hey, hey man, stop, <laughs> stop calling me that. Because he, he was a really tough dude. I never uh, used Lulu professionally because it just makes me sound like... I don't know, a cabaret star or something like that. Yeah, but you know, it, it's a, it's a thing with careers. Like I, I'm a comedian, and and I have a book coming out. So you never really know where your career is actually going to take you. So if cabaret star is on the is on the menu, hey, go for um, it. Yeah, I do have a name ready for it. <laughs> uh, so cool. Well, I'm I'm so happy that we were uh, you know able to make this happen. Uh, I'm in the United States. You're in England, so it's like a five hour difference. So this mm-hmm. is a, a very early. Uh, morning for me and what happens every every time that i have something early uh that's when my kids decide to sleep uh when i actually have something that i uh uh you know that i don't have to be up for that's when they're up at like five in the morning uh and all that and this is no i know the feeling this is no different um (laughs) so um i uh i'm really interested uh in your book uh in particular uh the case against uh the sexual revolution so uh, I'm not. I'm not that old to have uh, been a part of the. I guess the original sexual revolution. I guess I'm probably old enough to be uh, a part of the what came after it. Uh, but yeah, what was the uh, sexual revolution? When did that? When did that take place? When did that happen? I mean, it's like a. <laughs> it's kind of an ongoing historical process, right? But I I date it from the pill, the pill's appearance on the mug. I mean, specifically the pill being made available to unmarried women. Um, which happens in the mid to late 60s across the Western world. 
And the argument I make in the book is that 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 is such a technology shock. You know, it's the first time in the history of humanity that women are able to control their fertility. Um, I mean, there have always been methods of birth of, of contraception used, but not reliable ones and not ones that women could take charge of easily themselves. Um, and even though we've had, it's very common across across social history to see these kind of um, uh, roller coaster between periods of licentiousness and periods of prudishness. You know, famously, the 1920s were a very racy era. The Georgians were racy. The Victorian, their Victorian grandchildren weren't. Um, but all of these historical moments were limited by the fact that they didn't have birth control. They couldn't actually separate. Um, sex from reproduction in the way that we can and I think that that is the thing that means that the um, the sex revolution of the post-war period sticks to the extent that now it is so normalized you, you sort of hardly almost, almost think about it it is so obvious that you know sex is a leisure activity that needn't have anything to do with pregnancy and childbearing um, and that's what I'm trying to re-examine you know it's it's you know it's obviously the case that there are there has been lots of religious conservative critiques made of the sexual revolution. That's not the critique that I'm making. What's unusual, I think, about my argument is that I'm starting with feminist priors. I've got a long, you know, I've spent my whole professional life working in feminism in various different ways. I started off working at a rape crisis centre um, after I left university. I did a degree in women's studies. Um, I've worked as a sexual violence, domestic violence campaigner. Um, a journalist have been writing in these about these issues for a long time. Um, so the, the principle I'm starting with is the idea that I think it's important to protect women's safety and well-being. And what I end up concluding is that <coughs> the the value system in place that's come out of the sex revolution, the ideology of it, doesn't do that. It doesn't actually serve, serve women's safety and well-being. And the popular narrative, therefore, that the sex revolution was all about freeing women, was all about making women more happy, more fulfilled, more sexually liberated, I think is a false one. Yeah, well, it, well it's interesting just uh, I, I, I forget that the pill is a form of technology. You know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm so used to, uh, yeah. you know, gadgets and that sort of thing. And you're like, well, right. well what a a, you know, just a incredible, uh, you know, revolution on the, uh, on, on humanity that this came about. And it's, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's relatively, we're talking the 1960s. So this is what, 80, 80 years is my, not even a hundred years in. Five minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. In the history terms. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So with that, um, you know, with the pill, I, I start thinking about, uh, girlfriends that I've, that I've had and my wife and I, I, um, with uh with my wife this probably isn't i don't think this is too much information but uh my wife ended up going on contraception uh, while we were dating because she had um ovarian cysts um that were uh, actually like one of our i guess one of our early dates was we went to the emergency room together uh because uh very she romantic had, very yeah very romantic <laughs> and uh you know so being in the emergency room with her while they're taking her her white blood cell count and they're like oh we might have to do an emergency operation or that you know that sort of thing and then thankfully mm -hmm. that that didn't have to happen but um she was able to get on con contra contraception as a way to help her um to help her uh with that and but i mean if you know obviously most people use contraception because they don't they do not want to uh, get pregnant. What, what is the what is the effectiveness though? Because I've heard that it's actually not as effective at stopping pregnancy as as, uh, as, as a lot of us think it is. Yeah, the, yeah, it is. It is surprisingly ineffective. I mean, it depends what you're talking about. Things like the um, copper coil or the IUD are, are very effective um, because they're not because they get implanted in the uterus, so they're not subject to like user error mm -hmm. um whereas the pill theoretically is 99 percent effective but in practice it's more like 91 percent effective and it's still the most commonly prescribed birth control in the us and the uk um despite that fact so what that means in practice is if, if 100 women are taking it in any given year nine of them will get pregnant in that year which mm -hmm. is loads right? yeah which is why i think that which is why I think that what you see in the UK and the US and a lot of other places is this is this historical um, sequence, which starts with 
pill's invention, obviously, the pill being made available to married women, then the pill being made available to unmarried women, and then abortion being decriminalised. And I think the reason for that is that um, the the pill was just about effective enough to completely change sexual norms, mm. right? to completely upend the, the whole, all of the kind of social guardrails that have been put in place to protect against unwanted pregnancy. To, you know, I mean, all this social system that is basically designed to, to like keep horny young people away from each other, and to and to make sure that sex only happens within marriage, within a kind of like legally defined uh, family creation <laughs> unit, right? Right, right. Which is basically what marriage is. Um, that falls away. The shotgun marriage falls away. Um, you end up with a lot more, like the absolute amount of extramarital sex that's going on goes up a lot. You know, previously respectable girls would never be be having kind of sex in their teens or whatever. Now, it, and, and then the pill just changes all of that. It becomes so much more acceptable to do that, which actually leads to a lot more unwanted pregnancies mm. because the pill isn't actually that effective. And I think that's why abortion then comes through as a backup option. Um, and part of the reason that there's more social acceptance for it, you know, it's partly to do with feminist argu arguments about women's need for bodily autonomy. It's partly to do with the fact that um, uh, you've got like a lot of um, a lot of social social attitude changes going on at the same time. The 60s is a, a big decade, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's also to do with the fact now that you've got you know the daughters of politicians having extramarital sex, potentially wanting to have abortions, which is not something that was previously on the cards at all so i think that's what explains the sequence and, and the yeah the fallibility of of the pill is actually a really essential component of its effect yeah <laughs> that makes sense yeah yeah um yeah because you, you would think like oh if you know with birth control being readily available there would be like such a drop in the amount of abortions like there wouldn't be mm -hmm. there would basically be you know no need for them at the you know that's uh, to, what you would think extent. right you would, you, think would that, also, yeah. you would also think that there would be no single mothers right you know if women can control their fertility why on earth would you ever get into the situation where you're a single mother like it's a it's a, it's it's, it's, it's an inherently very very difficult state to be in because it's right. just there's so much more pressure on you financially and practically and whatever and yet actually post pill you see this massive massive rise in the proportion of mothers who who are who are having babies on their own you know i um uh, with with the podcast you know obviously um my, my listeners uh you know they know biographical info about me and uh so you know on on this subject in, in particular you know what you're describing it really makes me think about when i was when i was dating like right before i met i met my wife i was i was newly single so i was in like a kind of a bad relationship for almost five years and then it was sort of i'm 30 years old and i'm sort of you know uh, you know, sort of let loose, you know, and, and, and dating and, uh, and all that. And it's interesting because all the women that I, that I dated, they were all college educated, um, you know, uh, uh, upper middle class, uh, you know, they obviously know about birth control and they have all these things. And yet the amount of them who were not on birth control and who were totally fine with, you know, sleeping with me without, you know, without me using protection, you know, like not, not even, um, for some, not even, not even coming up in conversation, you know, and it's sort of like, well, for me, you know, I'm sort of, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, falling into the stereotypical guy role where it's like, oh, great. You know, this is, you know, I, uh, uh this is all, you know, what's, let's, let's sort of follow, um, the sexual pleasure to where it goes, but yet it's like, wow, the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think if there's like sort of a, a psychological component in there where it's like, while the, while the sexual freedom is there, there's still like it, that there's, I, I don't know. It's like a kind of biology. Uh, biology is still that an inconvenience. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah. 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 And something I find kind of <laughs> strange about, <laughs> um, so I still got a bit of COVID something that I find strange about, um, accounts of women that I've spoken to and read about is how I know of quite a few cases anecdotally of women who have got pregnant through casual encounters either because of birth control failing or just not like using it properly or at all 
and then they get pregnant and then they they don't even tell the man who impregnated them mm. and they just quietly get an abortion right and deal with all of the physical and emotional consequences of an abortion which like regardless of what you think about the the, the moral status of the fetus an abortion is not a trivial thing to go through right <laughs> it's like it, it's an inherently difficult thing to go through and it's a, and, and the and the physical and emotional burden falls well the physical burden falls entirely on the woman and the emotional burden also falls mostly on her um and it's so strange to me when you when you stop and think about it that women will feel sufficiently will 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 permit intimacy like in physical terms with men mm. who basically don't care if they get hit by a bus next week, right? Like in, in some casual encounters, you know, you have like right. no relationship whatsoever with this person. Um, so they'll, they'll permit that level of physical intimacy with all of its, you know, hugely consequential risk factors. Right. Um, but then wouldn't, wouldn't share with them the like inconvenient consequences that actually do come from heterosexual sex, even if you're using, even if you're using birth control, there's always a risk factor. And I think almost that there's this pressure on women to like, to play the role of the up for it, liberated woman who, you know, doesn't have to, doesn't have to worry about things like potentially getting pregnant, you know, um, but it's an act, right. And it's an act that depends, you know, one on the fact that, um, women are the ones who are, who are having to have all the side effects of contraception. I mean, a lot of women hate hormonal contraception. It really disagrees with them. Um, women are the ones who are actually having to go and have abortions when necessary. And women are also the ones who are often suppressing like their emotional instincts as well, because women actually don't really like, most women on average don't really like casual sex. Women like casual sex a lot less than men do. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, rooms of survey data. And so why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> it's basically it's basically my question yeah. and i think and i think the answer is that um the pill and and all the other components of the sexual revolution have basically created a sexual culture which is much more geared towards a kind of masculine style of sexuality and it comes with as well a feminist ideology which encourages that which sees um women behaving like men in every possible way you know in the workplace financially etc but also sexually has been aspirational and sees the rejection of like old-fashioned ideas about femininity as like the goal of feminism and i think that that i think that 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 whole idea is a mistake mm. I wrote I, a whole book about it <laughs> yeah I'm, i uh, uh to, to go back to the um uh, hormonal uh contraception i remember my my ex when she went on it it was insane. The, you know, I, she, she's, I, I, I don't even know if it, I don't know what bipolar necessarily is, but it would be like one second she was fine. And the next second she would like burst out in tears and just, you know, just crying or get really emotional. And this was mm -hmm. like very different, uh, very different than what she was like, uh, you know, before going on that. So, yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, the, 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 the changes and the effects that it has on your body is just pretty, pretty wild. And, uh, when, when it comes to like you know the uh, uh, the you know difference in like you know sex between you know men and women, it's sort of like um, it, it's it's almost like uh, I don't even know society or parts of society want women to be more like gay men in a way where it's where it's just like up for anything, ready to you know ready to screw. And uh, anybody who has gay male friends knows it's like you know you can go to a party and have sex with you know, countless guys. And then that's just a normal night. And then you go away, you know, there uh, you, you're able to have this without emotional uh, attachment. And I guess, you know, in, in a way it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, the pornographic fantasy of uh, that, you know, at least a lot of, you know, men have of, you know, just anonymous sex with beautiful women and then, and then you're gone. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, it, it just doesn't, um, it, it just doesn't seem something that that uh, that's doable in the in the long run, uh, especially if you're looking to have actual intimate uh, relationships with uh, uh, with someone and a loved one. Mm -hmm. The differences between gay culture and lesbian culture, I think, are very revealing of the differences to male, <laughs> male and female sexuality. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not all gay men, but that they're they're, they're 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 like there's lots of data out there, and there's a there's minority of gay men who basically live like lesbians. 
Um, and then there's another minority who are really promiscuous because this is a, and the you know, bathhouse culture and whatever is a, right. is, a, is, a, is a result of that um, because it's what happens when you've got male sexuality without women as a limiting factor. And then similarly, lesbians tend to be much more, there's much more emphasis on monogamy and commitment and um, lesbians tend to have known each other for a long, lot longer before they have sex and stuff like that. So this is like revealing the average preferences of men and women, I think quite clearly. Um, it's not, like it, it can be considered like somehow inappropriate to point it out. Mm. Yeah, I, I was, think, I, I I think was, everyone knows. I, I was going to say, you know, uh, there, there are people, there are critics who would say, how dare you even say something like male sexuality? How dare <laughs> you say that as if, you know, and it, and it, I, yeah, it's, it's one of these, uh, it's one of these things of trying to, you know, navigate these worlds of like, I guess, reality. And, and then um, I would call, you know, sort of like, uh, I don't know, academic bullshit uh, that, that, you know, there are differences between the, mm. but between the sexes, we are not, uh, you know, uh, equal, I, I would say like in our, uh, you know, uh, you know, hormonal balances and our, you know, uh, desires and, or, you know, and all that. And obviously that's going to have an impact, but when you try to, I think like tear all of that away and just, and, and try to say like, no, no, it's, we're all socially constructed to be this way. Like, you know, when I was a, a, you know, a teenage, a teenage boy or, you know, first, you know, starting puberty, like I had absolutely no control over erections and, and, and stuff that, that would happen. You know, I was, you know, sort of a, I was a, a victim of the, of the universe, <laughs> you know, at, at the time. Yeah. So how do you, um, you know, how do you have, uh, you know, talk to people who, you know, will, will criticize you for, you know, making those distinctions? Um, I mean, they criticize me a lot. Yeah, I, imagine. <laughs> I mean, I just get criticism for every angle. I don't mind. That was the, that was the, you know, I, I, I realized oh, that's what I was getting myself into mm -hmm. when I wrote the book. Um, I think that this instinct to try and deny the differences, I mean, physical differences, but also psychological differences, even more so comes from a good place sort of, I mean, it comes from the fact that historically, um, sometimes pseudoscientific ideas about psychological differences between the sexes have been used against women mm -hmm. um, to exclude us from professions and that kind of thing. So it's understandable that there would be a feminist resistance to statements along those lines. Um, I think though that I think we've as feminists have made an error in being so dogmatic on that front and not wanting to acknowledge research, which is becoming more and more copious with every passing day, um, that there are some important average differences between the sexes psychologically with, you know, with exceptions, there are clearly out outliers in every possible direction, but at the population level, those differences are marked. And I think that, you know, the research is morally neutral. If it's true, it's true. <laughs> and you just have to kind of <coughs> like, um, fit your politics around the truth um so part of what i'm trying to do with this book is i have i have an early chapter on um evolutionary psychology and the differences between men and women the the recognition of that differences is kind of threaded throughout the whole book um i'm saying okay these differences exist what then you know how do how do we deal with this if, if what we're if what we're interested in is trying to like promote harmonious relationships between the sexes um what's our what's yeah how, how do we reconcile this with feminist politics yeah is that your dog that's right that there? is my dog a, and i'm sorry is he part bir is he part bird sounds a little uh, <laughs> a, a little bird like he's he's ever so slightly whining because i think he thinks something's in the street <laughs> oh uh, that's okay i, I like i like that it, it adds flavor to the uh <laughs> to, to, to the episode um <laughs> Excuse yes. So, uh, so uh, you describe <coughs> describe yourself as a feminist. Yeah, I mean, like broadly defined. Mm -hmm. I, I that the, the feminism has a pretty bad rep, and a pretty low proportion of women describe themselves as feminists. Um, yeah, especially over the pa past five to seven years, it's been I think, dropping. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's because the dominant strain of feminism is the one that is. Um, preoccupied with erasing differences between the sexes. I mean, initially erasing differences in terms of uh, our social roles, 
but increasingly even denying the existence of sexual dimorphism. Um, and I and I think that that strain of feminism is seriously unpopular, even if it has kind of elite influence. Um, but I think it's completely cogent to say that actually feminism is just defined as like a political movement, like serving the interests of women. And that can be, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, that's a broad church. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of yeah. debate to be have about what about what that those interests are and how they are best served. Yeah, um, I, I remember seeing the shirt. This is what a this is what a feminist looks like, or this is what a male feminist looks like. Um, and I was thinking, well, okay, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, in, pretty- interesting thing about those shirts is they were create. I think at least in the UK, I don't know about the states, but um, they were designed by the Fawcett Society which is a very long-standing feminist charity um, named for Millicent Fawcett, who was a suffragette or suffragist. Um, and uh, Fawcett, I think, are very um, are very uh, invested in the kind of sameness feminism, mm. you know, very focused on things like combating gender stereotypes, um, getting women into positions of power in 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 professional contexts and so on and uh the 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 t-shirts is what feminists look like i mean they were initially criticized for the fact that they put them on say politicians who had cut funding for domestic violence services Mm. which doesn't look actually very feminist at all and then it was also discovered that um they had been made by women in sweatshops in i think bangladesh who were being paid really poorly and treated really poorly so it was all a bit of a PR disaster. <laughs> I could imagine. Yeah. I, <laughs> Those t-shirts. <laughs> um, I, I, well, yeah. I wonder if they would say like, okay, don't worry. We're uh, next time in, in the sweatshops, we're, we're just going to have the men make them. We're going to have men in sweatshops make them in order <laughs> to uh, bring some equity, um, equity to it. Well, uh, you know, you, you guys being in, in the UK, uh, it seems like Twitter is always blowing up with um, the latest row, uh, row or row about uh, J.K. Rowling, um, do, <laughs> yes. do, do, do you go? Do you go into any of those uh, issues in, in particular? Uh, I guess the intersection of you know transgenderism and, and feminism and 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 what that's you know what's happening with that, what that means. So I don't in this book, okay. but I do in general. I actually published an essay today in the Daily Mail about J.K. Rowling in defense of J.K. Rowling. Um, I th- I mean, the reason I decided not to write about it in this book, except very, you know, a couple of very brief references, is because, partly because there has been some fabulous books written already. Mm-hmm. Um, Kathleen Stock, who wrote my foreword, she's a friend of mine, um, she wrote a book called Material Girls, which is fabulous on um, the trans movement, uh, kind of assessing it as a philosopher, because her background is as an academic philosopher. She ended up losing her job. She famously lost her job at the University of Sussex for um, for expressing scepticism about the trans movement. Um, Helen Joyce's book, Trans, similarly, another excellent British writer. Um, the, uh, the push, the feminist pushback against the excesses of trans activism is very much centred in the UK. Mm, yeah. The the American feminists have uh, dropped the ball, <laughs> many of them on this. I think my theory about why that is, is that um, I think it's because in the UK, we don't have a Christian right to speak of, really. I mean, obviously, we do have some individual um, uh, religious conservatives and small groups, but we don't really have a powerful lobby force, um, which I think means that... Um, Feminists in the US are always kind of setting themselves up in opposition to the Christian right, are always right. focused on the Christian right and have this quite like binary view of their of their two movements, um, which I think has has meant, for instance, that feminists in the US are much more reluctant to talk about porn and the feminist critique of porn because you know, that's, a, that's like a religious thing, right? Then, and they're also much le- more reluctant to critique the anti-feminist aspects of the trans movement because, again, they don't want to be kind of confused with the Republicans pushing through bathroom bills and things like this. Whereas in the UK, that's not true. We don't really have 
um, that kind of opposition um, and actually the trans attitudes towards the trans movement are, are non-partisan. Like there are people in both the Labour and Conservative parties who are pro and anti. Um, you know, it was a Conservative party that proposed very controversial reforms to the law around um, sex reassignment. And it was also a Conservative party that withdrew <laughs> those reforms. So this isn't like a simple partisan issue in this country by any means. And you'll see as well across, you know, uh, left wing and right wing newspapers, for instance, will will like take different take not they, they will not take obvious sides in it. And, and J.K. Rowling is a great example of this because she has historically been um, a key funder of the Labour Party. She has a lot of kind of left wing principles. She's very feminist, and she's the most famous turf in the world. <laughs> right? Yeah, we'll, we'll put turf in. Uh, yeah, in, in scare quotes. But I, I mean, I kind of use I kind of use the word turf. Yeah. I find it quite funny. I mean, it kind of. I, I mean, it it, it kind of sounds cool, you know. It's like, quite. I think there's a reclaiming like cool. process. Yeah, I'll I'll happily call myself a tough. I mean, it clearly is used abusively. Um, oh yeah, yeah. But also, it has a certain ring to it. So. Yeah. Well, well, with with J.K. Rowling, um, I'm telling you, every single time she's trending, I am amazed by the hate that, yeah, that that's thrown her way. It's so vicious, isn't it? Yeah, because I, uh, I guess it was probably like maybe a year ago, I went to her website and I read her essay about yeah. uh, what about uh, transgenderism and feminism mm -hmm. and, and women. Yeah. And I thought, Oh, this, this sounds like a, um, for one, a, a victim of sexual abuse. Um, yeah. You know, she was yeah. uh, a, a woman who, um, you know, has really thought about these issues, really cares about these issues and cares about the people involved, both, trans uh, uh the transgender people and 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 uh and, and women uh -huh. and uh there is nothing in there that has the smell of hate nothing in there that has a smell of transphobia nothing 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 in there but mm -hmm. then the way that people portray her you would think that she wants to you know murder trans people and it's uh right. it, it it i i think i think i think that is also something that's 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 uh i guess helpful in it, it, it's sort of an example of, of just the way the debate happens where <coughs> people are so over the top of just uh throwing the worst at uh you know at someone like jk rowling and then those of us who have actually read her work are like oh no that's not right at all and now i can't take you seriously um you know it's like you, you sort of like lose the debate uh once you start lying about somebody i think yeah jk rowling has mass normie support um, the problem is just that she is deeply unpopular with people who are, well, it's because trans ideology is particularly um, embedded in very some very powerful cultural institutions, mm. um, you know, which is interesting. I mean, I think that, I do think that part of that is coming from the fact that um, one of the changes that we've that one of the material changes that we've seen to society over the last century, um, and particularly since the last couple of generations since the Sexual Revolution, is that we live much more gender neutral lives than our ancestors did. Mm. Men and women used to have much more like distinctly defined social roles um, and economic roles, and you used to socialize as well with each other much less you'd socialize with your kin but you wouldn't have you, you wouldn't have kind of these gender blended workplaces at all in the same way in most in most areas whereas now we have um very um gender neutral workplaces the the nature of a move away from manual and industrial economy towards service and knowledge economy means that women are much male physical strength doesn't really matter anymore. The immense economic importance of male physical strength, mm -hmm. particularly in the era before the internal combustion engine, right? It just isn't really relevant anymore. Men and women can do the same work, you know, like in almost every respect. Because of the pill, you can suspend your childbearing, like in every possible way, a, a female work and a male work are pretty much interchangeable. Like the, the 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 differences between the sexes seem really trivial. And if you don't even go to the gym, you have no, you don't play sports or anything. You don't even like play fight with your siblings, given that people are having smaller families as well. So um, mm. you might not even personally have any experience of the immense visit, 
strength differences between men and women. Um, and then you see, you know, like um, superhero films where you've got female superheroes, right. like, beat, you know, beating up half a dozen men um, effortlessly. So yeah. I think that there is quite a strongly for, 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 you know, this is less true for people who are still working, say, in agricultural work or farm or, or in factory work or whatever, who still kind of have some connection with like manual labor. But people who don't, I think it's quite easy for them to believe the claim that is inherent to trans activism, which is that the differences between the sexes are trivial and can be easily surmounted through kind of fairly minor medical interventions or even not even medical interventions at all can be surmounted just through wishful thinking and proclaiming yourself to be a member of the opposite sex. Um, I suspect that's the reason why the ideology has been more persuasive to women in kind of elite jobs mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the population are much less convinced as sorts of polling shows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, I did a radio interview uh, last week on uh, the Lars Larson show. Uh, he's out of uh, uh, Portland uh, in, in Oregon and in, in one of the States. And um, at the end of it, he brought up uh, uh, Leah Thomas. Do you know Leah Thomas, the swimmer, Yeah, the swimmer, uh, the swimmer, uh, the bi biological male uh, yeah. uh, swimmer who I, I don't know what the, uh, what the, his, what Leah's uh, exact ranking was as, when swimming against men, but it was like something in like ranked 400 something. And then, yeah. you know, coming uh, and swimming against women and completely destroying that. And um, uh, uh, Lars asked, you know, you, you know, are me and my uh, colleagues, you know, open to be making jokes, uh, you know, about Leah. And, um, <coughs> and I said, there's definitely a lot to make fun of. Um, and I think Leah Thomas is also like sort of an example of uh, what allyship means. Because it's very easy for, say, a uh, a straight man to come and say, "Yeah, Lee is a woman." Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, because at no point do you actually have to like date Leah, yeah. or or you know date a trans woman. You know, so all the you know I I know so many guys who have I've called out and said, "Oh, if you think that that you know so and so is a woman, well." Uh, Take her out on a date, show her a good yeah, time, yeah, yeah. start a relationship, walk the walk. Her. Yeah, exa exactly. And uh, you know, I, I guess that that you know, it's another example of the virtue signaling that you don't actually have to uh, step step up to the plate and and live a uh, and live it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um, I mean, primarily the trans um, controversy is. Um, in general, the people who feel most strongly about it on both sides are women. So the, the, the greatest pushback from feminists is coming, what well, the greatest pushback is is largely coming from from feminists who are, who, who are you know, concerned about women's rights. Um, and equally, the most vehement allies tend to be women, tend to be younger women as well. I think there's a, I think there's a generation gap. And that gets framed as being... Um, to do with the fact that young women are more enlightened and more compassionate. Right. This that's kind of central to the whole progressive idea, right? That every generation gets more like gets closer and closer to the truth. Um, whereas these old old women are just kind of dinosaurs, or whatever. This was this is actually a, a thing in the UK where that's um, politician called David Lammy um, referred to uh, turfs as dinosaurs, and ever since women have been showing up to protest dressed in like big plastic dinosaur suits and wearing dinosaur badges and stuff like that. It's very funny the the, the, the gender critical movement in the UK has a real sense of humor. It's often, it's like really, really good at, um, <laughs> at attracting publicity. There's this woman called Posey Parker. Who's, um, Oh yeah. 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 yeah English woman, but she's been on Tucker Carlson and stuff, right? She's got, she's got global reach and she, um, she organized for these big posters to be put up around um, around the UK, which were just black background, white writing, and it was just woman, noun, adult, human, female, like the, the dictionary definition of woman. Um, and it was such a clever idea. And she's got T-shirts all over as well. And it was such a clever idea because it caused outrage. And there were right. so many efforts to try and get these posters taken down and, like, um, 
people like calling the police or trying to get them reported to the advertising standards agency and all this kind of stuff caused absolute uproar but anyone like normal would obviously look at the definition of woman on a poster and be like I don't understand what the problem is so you know there's there's been some really clever um there's been some really clever activism I'm really hoping that American women are going to wake up at some point I mean they clearly are I mean it may be that it's different it ends up being different in the states um the pushback against this it's clearly happening it just seems to be happening primarily from the right the republicans yeah yeah um whereas here it's much more bound up in like to the trade union movement and um it's yeah it's it's, it's got a really different flavor so i mean maybe this is gonna maybe it's gonna um just have a have a very different character in the states i don't know but with uh with the example you you gave of um you know calling um uh, calling those women uh, dinosaurs mm. uh, in, in all, in, you know, in all of these examples, it just seems like people want a justification to hate on women. Uh, and it's sort of like, you know, if that politician was to call, you know, elderly voters, dinosaur, you know, elderly women oh, voters, yeah. just dinosaurs, political you know, suicide. <laughs> exactly. Politi yeah. political suicide, or yeah. if, you know, to get in front of a, you know, a young woman's face and yell and yell bitch or, 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 you know, uh, I know you guys use cunt uh, in there different, uh, you know, differently where, where you guys come from. It's like, slightly more, yeah, loose with it. Yeah. Um, uh, like that would be, that yeah, would be yeah. completely wrong. But yep. now you have, well, no, no, you are, you are against this uh, trans ideology. Therefore, yeah. We are justified to do these horrific, th say these horrific things, and then also do these horrific things to you. Um, yeah, just it, look it, at the the yeah. tweet sent J.K. Rowling's way. Yeah. Uh, uh, I um, a woman called Becca Riley Cooper. She compiled like a after the initial J.K. Rowling like big outcry in 2020. She compiled a like a, a collage of tweets sent at J.K. Rowling that were like the most horrendous examples, and it's just yeah bitch, hag, whore, whatever, like every misogynist insult you can imagine. Um, like so many like lurid, lurid rape threats. Yeah. All of this stuff. And because she wrote about having been abused by her ex-husband and being worried about women only refuges, right? Like yeah. it, it's it's crazy. And I think it does have I think there's definitely like I in general am quite reluctant to to ascribe social phenomena to sexism purely mm -hmm. like yeah. i'm very if i'm very like in my own personal life it takes a lot for me to think that someone is is like behaving badly towards me because of sexism it's like my it's like my explanation of last resort um i think that you can't like when you see the misogyny in the language you can't help but think that that must be going on and you also notice that women get so much more abuse than men do for saying the exact same things about mm -hmm. this. I think the other thing is that people get a lot more abuse if they're coming from the left. If there's a feeling that you can get away with a lot more if you're on the right. And I think that's because there's this feeling of kind of betrayal that if you're, you're supposed to be a good liberal leftist and yet you're saying these forbidden things, you get, I think that you attract more ire because of the feeling that you're a traitor. And, and, and you're actually, also, yeah. And you're also giving, you, you're giving the other side ammunition because it's like, well, yes. if, if you're wrong, yes, you're making us vulnerable. Yeah. To, to more opening up to, to, to more criticism. Um, yeah. a, a while back, a friend, a friend of mine shared an article about a, um, a trans, uh, woman, uh, who got into mixed martial arts, and this isn't, uh, th th there was one years ago, Fallon, I think Fox was uh, their, their last name. Uh, yes. This was a new one where this person got into mixed martial arts uh, to compete against women, had only been training like maybe two years or, or something like that, mm -hmm. like a very short amount of time, transitioned and got into this fighting and, uh, you know, completely annihilated this uh, one woman in one of their first fights. And my friend pointed out, it's like, isn't it a little weird? Like you, you transition to a woman, and one of the first things you do is beat the shit out of a woman. It's like, a bit weird, that isn't it? That's yeah. very odd, you know, to to go that to go that route. I think the explanation for a lot of this, I don't know if listeners will have heard of um, uh, Ray Blanchard, 
he says, oh, yeah. yeah, he's a in um, Canada, right? I yeah, he's um, I think sexologist is probably his his professional title. He's like a psychologist who specialises in the study of human sexuality. Uh, very interesting guy, and he um, he coined what's called Blanchard's typology of transsexualism, which um, like quite a long time ago now, I can't remember when, but this is many decades ago. And um, he basically theorizes that there are two motivations that men have for transitioning to, to, to being women. Um, one, one group, which is nowadays seems to be smaller than um, proportionally smaller than previously is um, very effeminate gay men who have been gender non-conforming since childhood um have t very stereotypically feminine interests or often quite sort of petite um are exclusively interested in sexually interested in other men um and transition um often actually transition because they come from very homophobic contexts like for instance in iran is one of the leading world capitals for sex reassignment surgery because in iran it is illegal to have same-sex relationship but but uh, but, but sex change is actually encouraged because it seems to be kind of, um, you know, better to, to change your body so it appears as if you're a heterosexual than to live as a gay man. So, you know, often there's often the stories, the, the motivation behind transitioning for these men is, is, is to do with a lot of, you know, shame, self-hatred. There's often really kind of a miserable backstory. So, and, and then when they transition, which are often quite young, they tend to pass quite well. And then there's another group and this group don't like to be described as such, but auto know, autogynophilia, autogynophiles, yeah, who are oh. straight men, generally quite gender conforming when they're growing up, to quite masculine interests. It's a surprising number of them who have been in the military, who've been CEOs, you know, who've done all sorts of like quite macho jobs, um, who have a sexual interest in being seen as a woman. The auto meaning, you know, self, gyny, woman, philia, love. Um, it's, I mean, it's related to cross dressing fetish. It's like a more extreme version of a cross dressing fetish. And um, it's the autogynophile group from whom the crazy abuse is coming, generally. The other group, androphile group, so called the gay men, they, they're much more likely to just live their lives keep themselves themselves you know they're not interested in calling jk rowling a whore right mm. it's it's the autogynophile group because i think the that there's that with some exceptions you know there are some there are some auto, autogynophilic men who are open about the nature of their fetish and will, will kind of talk um will talk publicly and kind of calmly about all of this though they do exist it's more common though for it to be a source of great shame and they're desperate to hide the fact that their desire to transition is sexually motivated um once you know about autogynophilia the whole thing makes sense it's one of those things that kind of is really shut down knowledge oh, about oh yeah I, there, there's yeah. A, a, a book i read um um i believe a the author is Bailey. Um, oh, the uh, man who would be queen. The man who would be queen. Which um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got so much. He got he got stalked. He got death threats. He got threats against his children. Yeah. Like the whole thing. Um, but, but, which are all you know book. very reasonable re, uh, responses to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to to those arguments. And 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 it's not. And again, it's you know with uh, you know with with these these theories, there's nothing about them that's saying someone should be denied. Uh, rights or somebody should be abused or, or anything like that it's like this is a human phenomenon and mm -hmm. let's let's see what what's going on i mean i'm you know reading that book and like you said it, it all starts to make sense it um yeah i mean you know you know in a way it's kind of unfortunate that you know like say for example i'm, I'm 40 and like i have two uh two kids married i've been you know heterosexual my my whole life Maybe the occasional weird fantasy, but uh, other than uh, other than that, imagining like in ten years, where my when my hairline is further back on my head, that I feel like I'm a woman and want to declare myself a woman and and dress up and and all that. Mm. I mean, it, I'm gonna have a. It, it's a very. Uh, it's 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 quite. It's gonna be quite the task to get other people on board with the fact that I'm a woman now. 
yeah. because I just don't, you know, I'm a hairy dude, you know. Which is kind of all the more reason to 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 um to be vehement about it. I mean, from from some men's perspective, you right. know, you can't pass. Yeah. You're often having a lot of family conflict around this. Like I think everyone kind of in your life knows that this is this is kind of crazy. Yeah. So you've got to like you know for some for some for some personalities that just encourages even more kind of aggressive identification well yeah and, identity. and it also just seems to you know we're in a we're in a time where it's not enough just to be who you are you have to demand that everyone accepts who you are and yeah. you know agrees with and that is just a i mean that, that's just a recipe for for disaster your, your dog knows yeah your dog just, <laughs> Your dog wants to be accepted right now. He agrees. He agrees. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it seems like that that's the, those are the times we're living in where mm -hmm. uh, people who are mentally ill, like accept me for my mental, you know, even with this mental illness, you must accept me as opposed to like, wait, you're mentally ill. Like maybe, maybe you need some help. Um, and it shouldn't be a, you know, a, a mm. defining factor in your, in your life. I don't know. I think this decision to, um, The decision to abandon shame. Right. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Right. I mean, the, the, I mean, the perverse thing is actually there is still lots of like public shaming and stigma. It's just attached to different things. You know, the shame associated with, um, I don't know, doing a bad tweet mm. and, get, and getting your, like, you're losing your job and your life destroyed. Like, that's fine. Um, but there shouldn't be shame associated. It's, 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 it's yeah, it's complicated, but it's yeah. a strong, it's a strong rhetorical move, you know, to say, don't shame me for, and it does mean that you end up with, um, I mean, you end up with a very kind of fragile situation where on the one hand you're saying, you know, I just want to be left alone to, to live my own life. I just want to do my own thing. Fine. But, but that whole project entirely depends on everyone else. Like, denying the truth of their eyes yeah and that's just like it's not a sustainable way of being right really. like you're so vulnerable to everyone else's um not even unkindness just sort of seeing reality through other people's eyes is very very painful yeah and you know something about being uh being a father and um um sort of experiencing the world through my 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 children's eyes you know my 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 young, my oldest is um is two two in like two or three months or something like that and um I've got two under two that's tough oh man yeah <laughs> i've got one under two it's quite one tough. under two just, <laughs> yeah just, if you're gonna have another just just give a minute just just wait yeah a little while. But, but congratulations that, that's um but uh you know something that i realized like every uh, everything that my son is experiencing is new Right, mm. so there, there's something really magical about that. Like, wow, he's never tasted ice cream before. He's never, yeah, it's lovely, this, isn't it? He's never yeah. heard this song before. It's uh, the, there's something yeah. really wonderful there. Yeah. And then there's another part that is so interesting is, um, as he's you know navigating the world, he's also trying to communicate that world to me by mm. you know pointing out uh, his world is is choo choos. He loves choo choos, <laughs> and he goes like, what's like, what's that? A choo choo? What's that? A yeah. choo choo? Uh, dinosaurs, so he would absolutely love, you know, all the turf stuff and you know, dinosaurs. <laughs> but what I see there is he's trying to communicate with me the world as it is, because mm. if if he's pointing to something that isn't a choo choo, right? It's not going to make sense, and we're not going to be able to communicate. Mm. Like there's there's reality. A there's a shared reality thing. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a shared reality here. And, yeah. you know, it's funny noticing that with my child who's trying so hard to communicate with the adults around him and, and understand the world. Meanwhile, we have adults that are completely, you know, kind of turning away from that and saying, mm -hmm. no, you know, you're going to, I want you to experience this world as I see it rather than as it actually is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I think that was deep. Yeah. That was <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it is the heavenly thing about children isn't it that like you have you heard the phrase a hedonic treadmill no no it's the idea that you um there's something kind of innate to people to human beings in that whenever we achieve something great it, it feels great for like five minutes and then you're like okay on to the next thing and you end up on this kind of treadmill where you're always chasing oh. 
Oh, I've never heard it, but but that's what I that that's what I'm on. Yeah, we've all yeah we've all felt it, right? Whereas, um, and it's one of the things that's kind of dissatisfying about um, a lot of areas of life, like world of work or um, sport or anything. You know, like you achieve something, but then it's like you need the next hit, you need the next hit. And I think that one of the things that's wonderful about having children is you don't have that hedonic treadmill effect because they're constantly changing, and every week they do something new and beautiful. Um, they're just like they're just like constantly satisfying to be around mm. in that yeah. sense and there's a constant feeling of like wonder and achievement as a parent yeah that's a beautiful way to put it and i think that's a that's a, a great place to uh uh to leave off uh, uh <laughs> we can louise, all go back to our toddlers <laughs> yeah louise perry uh she's the author of the case against the sexual revolution a new guide to sex in the 21st century uh it's currently out in the uk and then in september it'll be out in the united states yep. uh guys definitely pick it up and uh follow her work uh she has a recent article in the the daily mail uh check that out and, and thank you so much for for making the time i really appreciate it it's, it's a, a nice reason to wake up early in the morning to uh, have a conversation <laughs> like this Thanks so much, Lee. Take care. Thank you guys so much for listening. And one more time, you got to check out the Soho Forum debate series this Monday, August 15th at the Sheen Center on 18 Bleecker Street in New York City. They're going to be debating climate science. I'm going to be there. Come say hi. Head to the SohoForum.org for tickets and info. And again, please order my book, That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore, on the death and rebirth of comedy. Just follow the link in the description or head over to Amazon and search for Lou Perez. That joke isn't funny anymore. And please subscribe to my podcast. Leave a five-star review. Why not? Sign up for my newsletter at theluperez.com. And if you want other ways to support my work, you can join theluperez.locals.com. And of course, be sure to support my sponsors, palomaverdecbd.com. Use promo code Lou for 25% off purchases over $75 and black organic cold brew. B-L-V-C-K-B-R-E-W dot com. Use promo code Lou for free shipping. Thank you.